Hello everyone, welcome again to Arkansas Live. Glad you joined us for today's edition. All week we're talking about the great cloud of witnesses. Yesterday we identified who those people are. Today we're going to talk more about it. First of all, we need to pray for all those in authority. That's what it says in Timothy. As believers, we can live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty if we'll pray for those in authority. So join me now wherever you're watching. Father, we pray for our president, our vice president, our governor, our mayors, our city officials, senators, representatives. We pray for all those in authority, police officers. We pray for spiritual authority, pastors. We pray, Father, for the peace of God that passes all understanding, the joy of the Lord, which is their strength. We pray a blood covering over all of those in authority. No weapon formed against them will prosper. No evil shall befall them. No plague come near them. We bind principalities, powers, rules of darkness, and wicked spirits. We thank you for wisdom and knowledge and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray every day for our leaders and all those in authority. Uh, if you're a, a young man or a young woman that's uh, appreciative of law enforcement, and you want to serve your community, especially in the city of Little Rock, then find out how you can uh, enlist in the police officer training program. Become a police officer. Uh, you know, the, the police in Memphis come to Little Rock to recruit police officers for Memphis. Uh, if, if you're wanting to get into law enforcement, then sign up for the Little Rock Police Force. And above all, all our, our citizens ought to be praying for every police officer. Now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12 and let's read verses 1, 2, and 3. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Now, if you're wearied and faint and afraid and fearful, then you have to do what the Bible says. Consider him. Consider Jesus. He endured more contradiction of sinners than you ever will. He said, you have not resisted yet unto blood, striving against sin. But Jesus did. He was our model. So we can follow his example. Now, the great cloud of witnesses that's referred to here is all those mentioned in the uh, 11th chapter of Hebrews. And we read them all yesterday. And then we got to uh, verse 32 where it named some of these uh, great cloud of witnesses and then some of them were, were not named. Uh, they subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight. Uh, women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings. They were stoned, sawn in two, tempted, slain with a sword. This, this, is a, this is a hero hall of fame of faith. And everything that's mentioned here, everything they did, they did through faith. And let me just digress here just a minute. When you, when you use that word faith so much, and you talk about it, we need to go back and explain the message that I taught some time ago called the way of faith. Because when you say it, I know there are people that don't know, what are you talking about, the way of faith? What do you mean by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Sarah, by faith, by faith, by faith? These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but they saw them afar off. They lived their life like that World War I soldier that I quoted yesterday. They found in his diary, he fought in World War I and died 
said, I fought as if the whole war depended on my efforts alone. That's the way you have to live your life. Now look at Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He actually, this was Paul, this was Saul before he became Paul. He, he actually was getting in our modern day vernacular, he was getting a warrant for the arrest of Christians so he could bring them before the courts and persecute them, condemn them, kill them. But he was looking for those that were in that way. What way? I mean, you've heard this statement before, I'm sure. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be any evidence to convict you? <laughs> Sad to say, a lot of people that call themselves Christians, there would be no evidence that they were Christians. Uh, go over to Acts 19. I was gonna, I was gonna go somewhere else, but I think I'll skip it. Acts 19, and let's look at verse 23. Acts 19:23. And the same time there arose no small stir about that way. Several times in the book of Acts, it talks about people that were, quote, in that way. In what way? The way of faith. These people in the New Testament were being identified, accused, arrested, killed, tortured for their faith in Christ Jesus. They had become believers in Jesus, the Messiah. They were raised under the law, but they were being changed by faith in Christ Jesus. And the religious people and the political people, uh, they didn't like it. So the, um, it even tells stories of how some soothsayers, magicians, uh, men that were controlling these activities. Today you could say men that are controlling the lottery, controlling marijuana. They're making millions. They're making money off of all of this. Well, in the Bible, they were making money off of fortune tellers, soothsayers. In one incident... It shows that a woman who Paul uh, rebuked the demon spirits that were operating through her, it said it, she was bringing her masters much gain. Folks, you've got to realize that the, the money force, uh, uh, the largest supporter of the Democrat Party that gives more money than anybody else issued an indictment. Get Trump out of office or you get no more support. These people are serious. They're, they're, they're as serious as the mob. I mean, they, 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 they don't like the country making its right turn now into a righteous revolution, godliness, values, godly values, biblical values. So they, they're, they're out to steal, kill, and destroy uh, all of the vices, the, the lottery, I mean, we've been lied to so many times. Only 18 to 20 percent of the money derived from the lottery goes to help education. Where does the other 80, 82 percent go? Have you ever asked yourself that? You ever, you ever traced it? You ever found out where it's going? This marijuana thing is the biggest hoax. And, you know, and the people of Arkansas that voted it in, they, <laughs> they're frustrated now because they can't go down and get them some marijuana. And now doctors are saying, we're not going to recommend this. It's all, uh, it's all money driven. It's all money driven. When are, when are the voting public, when are the righteous going to wake up and do something? Wake up, stand up, speak up. That's what you can do. This great cloud of witnesses that we're talking about, that's what they did. So all these people that, the, that Saul 
was out to, to arrest and throw to the lions. These people had chosen to follow Jesus. They were raised under the law, but now there's a new way. Hebrews talks about it, a new way. The way of faith in Christ Jesus. So my whole reason for bringing that up is that's what it's referring to when it talks about people of that way, the way of faith. This great cloud of witnesses, they were, they were people that were standing up, speaking up. Some of them were being killed, but they were, they were uh, obtaining great victories. And uh, they were people of faith. What does that mean, people of faith? I'm not talking about your denomination. Their faith was in Christ. Their faith was in Jesus as the Son of God, Messiah. Now it says in Hebrews 12 that we are to look to Jesus and consider Him because He is the author and finisher of our faith. The, the end result is good, folks. We've, we're the overcomers. We're born of God. We win, but we're in the good fight of faith. Now, I told you yesterday we're going to talk about the greatest generation. <clears throat> you, you probably heard this term. And we've given these generations labels. I don't know who did this or where it came from. The first reading that I did on it was Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation. And he identified my father's generation, the World War II generation, which by and large are mostly all gone. And I, I, I looked at the, the distinguishing characteristics of that generation. First of all, and I know because my father was that generation and I, I talked with him, observed him, watched him. First of all, they were children that made it through the Great Depression. I'm not talking about this wimpy 2008 recession. I'm talking about a Great Depression where 25% of the people, the workforce, were out of work. My grandfather, my father's father, told me that he, he worked for the postal system. He was the superintendent of, uh, um, down at the U.S. postal system down on Broadway. He, he told me that uh, he kept his job. He had a family of four. He was a tither. They were good, God-fearing people. He would drive to work, and he would see. He told me, he said, there was a soup line go for blocks. Men starving. I mean, they were in line to get soup and get work. And it was a hard time. And my father grew up uh, in, in that time, in the late 20s, early 30s. And he made it through that Great Depression. And then when he enlisted uh, and when he enrolled in college, after he graduated from high school, he enrolled at uh, Little Rock Junior College, which is now the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. It was a small school off of Hayes Street. <laughs> Some of you don't realize what I'm talking about. University Avenue used to be Hayes Street. And when I was a kid, it was gravel. That was the end of the city. I mean, they hadn't even paved it yet. It was a gravel street. And Little Rock Junior College was where my dad went to college. He was a freshman, 18 years old. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, my dad was a civil engineering student and he was in his first year in college and all of a sudden he hears on the radio where the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. So I asked my dad, I said, Daddy, after 9-11 happened, I called my dad down in Florida. He'd retired and lived down there and I said, are you okay? I, he said, yes, I'm fine. I said, well, Daddy, Daddy, tell me, what did you do? When, the Japan, when you heard the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. He said, well, I did what we all did. He said, we went down and enlisted. Now, are you listening to this? <laughs> this is so thrilling because I grew up in those war years and then, and then uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to make sure that I could serve my country because as kids, we grew up, we, we, all we heard uh, from the time we were infants was the war going on over in uh, Germany and in the Pacific. We go to the movies and the movie tone news was where you got all your news. There was no television. You had radio, but you, and they would show you pictures of our boys fighting overseas. 
All the magazines, Life magazine, the newspapers, uh, all talked about war bonds and Rosie the Riveter and the women were working in the munitions factories. And so you grew up with that in your consciousness and that was just what the world was like in those days. That was the way of life. When Daddy uh, went down and signed up and joined the Merchant Marines, and uh, the Fighting Merchant Marines is what they call them, and he shipped out. Of course, he and Mama ran off and eloped and got married. I was born nine months later. I mean, a lot of people did that. <laughs> they didn't know what the world was going to be like. They didn't know whether they were going to live or die. They didn't know how they were going to make it. I mean, gasoline was rationed, tires were rationed, sugar was rationed. You had to have little ration cards to go to the, to the store. And we had a corner grocery. There were no supermarkets. You go down there and you get whatever you needed for the day or the week. And if you had a ration card, you could get more sugar or whatever. It, it was a different way of living. That's the greatest generation. They went through the Great Depression. They fought in World War II. My dad shipped out. He never got back to college. He became a success because he worked hard. He came home years later. I didn't know. I didn't recognize him because I hadn't seen him much. And Mama had a picture of him by the bedside. And that's who I knew as my father. But when he came home, then my sister was born. So we began as a family. Now, this is the third, third part of the greatest generation, the first part of the greatest generation was they went through the Great Depression. Secondly, they fought in World War II. Thirdly, they rebuilt America. Did you hear that? I mean, you know, during the war, they shut down the refrigerator making plants and started building tanks and, and, uh, and weapons and airplanes. I mean, we were a war machine. We were building uh, machinery to fight and win the war. If we hadn't, we'd possibly all been speaking German or Japanese today. So thank God for that greatest generation. But now listen to the, listen to the intestinal fortitude. Listen to the ideology, the values. The, the, the characteristics of the greatest generation was they, they loved, and I, I, I wrote it down this way, their commitment to God and their commitment to their country. Their commitment to God and their commitment to their country. There was no political correctness. There was no intolerance. There was none of that stuff. Um, when I was in the Navy and I did serve uh, from 63 to 69 in the United States Navy, six years, um, we were called to... Um, go to Guantanamo Bay in the early 60s and we were gunfire support uh, destroyer. I was on a destroyer and we shelled the islands. We, we never heard anybody talk about homosexuality. There, there, was no, there was no evidence of that in the military. Are you kidding me? You'd wind up uh, upside down in a trash can or you'd, you know, get thrown overboard. I mean, life was different. Culture was different. Values were different. That's what made that generation so great. We were all there to serve our country, to serve our nation. Our president at that time, JFK, John Kennedy, he was a naval officer. So we had someone we could look up to that had served his country. That World War II, then, then after uh, Franklin Roosevelt died and President Eisenhower, I mean, I mean Truman became president, and then President Eisenhower, five-star general, came out of World War II. He became president. All of, our, uh, all of our leaders, our political leaders, our heroes were veterans. We had a generation there that we could see modeled before us, God and country. They were the greatest generation. They didn't even blink when their nation went to war like my dad did and all of his buddies. They went down and enlisted. They didn't go to Canada. They didn't run off. They didn't, they didn't hide. They ran toward the enemy, not away from the enemy. That spirit is the spirit of the great cloud of witnesses. Now, 
Look at what's happened in our society today. Why don't we have that same? Now, we do have men and women in the military, all branches of the military, that have fought for years in the Middle East, uh, in Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom and all of the Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we have men in our church that have been deployed three times. Three times. Most of the World War II generation, they, they were just deployed once. Three times. Why? Lack of military personnel. One young man that I know very well, <laughs> he's been deployed three times and uh, he, he listens to, he, he did listen to President Obama say, we don't have any troops over in this area. Uh, we're not engaged there. And yet he was there commanding troops and he was, he, he was thinking to himself and to his wife who was back in the States. Says, Why would our commander in chief say that? That's not true. We're here. We were sent here. There's still young men and women that are dedicated to God and country. But the culture is not. The culture has been brainwashed. The, brain, the, the, the culture is brain dead. You talk about the greatest generation. Look at the generations now. I, I, I listened to an interview from one army general. They asked him, what about this generation, general? Uh, how would they fit in the armed forces? He said, well, they're smarter than any other generation. They're more tech savvy and, and intelligent. But he said, there's no stability. There's no standard. He said they couldn't even make it through boot camp. There's no discipline. But see, that greatest generation came out of the Great Depression. And they knew that the, like the World War I soldier, they knew that the salvation of our nation depended on them and them alone. Boy, that's the way you've got to think. Well, let's, let's parlay that into where we are now, what we're talking about. Our culture and our generation depends on you alone. You can't wait for the next person to do it. You can't wait for me to do it, the governor to do it, the mayors to do it, the senators, representatives. You have to do your part. You have to stand up. You have to speak up. You have to join the righteous revolution. You have to be moved, motivated, keep the momentum going. Find what you can do. And do it with all your might. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, Pastor Caldwell, I can't do this and I can't do that. But there's one thing that all of us can do, and that's give. Every one of us can give. Give to ministries, to churches, to Christian television networks like VTN. Give to those that are preaching the gospel. Give to those that are reaching out and helping people. Give to those that are feeding, clothing, nurturing, ministering. Give to organizations that you know are making a difference. Everybody can do that. Everybody can give something. Uh, if we have time, we can, we can address that. So, the greatest generation, what made them great was their commitment to God and their commitment to their country. They made it through the Great Depression, served in World War, fought in World War II, then came back and rebuilt America. Now, what we're going to have to do, and I'll do my best to um, make this palatable for everybody and preach between the lines so everybody will uh, not be mistaken or confused. But we're going to have to develop a victorious faith. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. I, I heard someone say one time, there is a peace that can only be found on the other side of war. Now, as you plainly know, if you've watched and listened to me very long, you know I'm not a pacifist, but I'm not a warmonger either. But I counted it a privilege to serve my country. Actually, uh, when Desert Storm broke out, I... I <laughs> I got this flyer in the mail from the Army, and uh, I called to re-enlist. 
uh, I don't know how old I was, but maybe uh, in my 60s then. And I called to, re to re-enlist, talked to the recruiter, and I said, I'd like to re-enlist as a chaplain. I said, I served six years in the Navy. And I said, I'm in good health. I'm strong, and I can do all this. He said, how old are you, sir? And I told him, he said, I'm sorry, sir. I appreciate your, <laughs> your desire and your willingness. He said, but you're too old. I wanted to go and encourage the troops. I wanted to, to, to fulfill that need. I wanted, to, I wanted to stand in the gap. You know, in Ezekiel, it said, God looked for a man that would stand in the gap. Well, we can all stand in the gap in prayer, in giving. But listen to this. I'm not advocating war. I'm just trying to show you the, the, the determination that we as Christians, as believers, need to have. 2 Timothy 2, 1. Thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. Faithful men. Man, our society would be different. Our culture would be different. We wouldn't have all of these single parent families. We wouldn't have all these mothers and grandmothers, aunts, trying to raise these children if the man that fathered these children would be faithful. As any fool, any, any, any male can sexually reproduce a child, but that doesn't make him a father. You have to make a commitment to be a father. He said, I want you to uh, teach others, commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Listen to this. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Man, we want it too easy. We want to quit when things get tough. But you have to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, we'll continue this tomorrow. Great cloud of witnesses. VTN is on Facebook. Find us at VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection. You can follow me on Twitter, happy underscore Caldwell. This episode's available to watch online. If you missed it or you want to watch it again, log on to vtntv.com. Click on Watch On Demand. And we're, of course, available uh, anywhere in the world via a live stream. Uh, we got some of our first donations from India and Australia the other day, people that are watching VTN in these other countries and helping support. That's wonderful. We praise God. Remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching, too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at P.O. Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. Or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com.